Okay, welcome back. Um, hopefully, yeah, this is recording. That's very good. Computer graphics, computer graphics. And you fell in the room. That's very good. This is going to be our new home for the next uh, four weeks, wow. starting tonight. So next, uh, the entire month of October, we'll be in this room. It's kind of an interesting room. I kind of like it. It's different. So, hmm. unless you want to go have, go to salsa. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what you're looking at is the OpenGL graphics application assignment number one, which is probably something you should start thinking about. And before I talk about assignment number one, let me just demonstrate to you that OpenGL actually does work on my computer. Last time, if you remember, if you were here, I installed, um, what is this? I don't know what that is. I installed uh, Dev C++, and I went through the whole thing, and then I got an error message. Well, the funny thing was is I turned my computer off. And then I turned it back on and no more error. I went, okay, let me fix this error message, right? So I, I, I got to troubleshoot this. I got to get this to work for my next class, you know. Let me go in here. Let me take a look. Let me get this to work right. And lo and behold, I just turned everything off, went home for the night, came back, you know, and I turned my computer back on. I get home and it works perfectly now. It just fixed itself. So here's what I'm thinking. Turn your computer off. You get that error message. <laughs> I believe what ended up happening was because I'm running this in a parallels window. When I shut the parallels window down, I didn't actually shut parallels down. And I'm thinking that there was something left in memory, and that piece of memory, whatever it was, was not resetting my environment variables correctly. Perhaps, I don't know. Because um, it was a very weird message, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And let me tell you what the message was, actually. I was going to, uh, if you were not here for the install of this, check out the video from last class meeting. It's up on bhacker.com. It's up on YouTube. And it goes through an install, and at the end, I go to test it, and it fails. So now I'm going to do redo that part of the video right here. I'm going to open it up, and I'm going to run, and now it's going to work. So instead, I'm going to go open project file. Nope, I'm going to create a new project. I'm sorry. Ah, no, I'm too far ahead of myself here. New project. So this is what I was doing to test my installation. And I'm going to hit the media, multimedia tab right here. And then I'm going to hit GLUT, because that's the basic GLUT program that I wanted to create a new project for. I'm going to go OK. Watch it fail this time. I'm just going to overwrite what I have here. Overwrite it, yeah. So I get this demo here, and which has just main. And main is in the window, actually, here. And Maine's got a bunch of stuff I'm going to go over today because we can actually kind of see this work now. Not too much code. If I run it, uh, let me compile it first, save it. When I was compiling it, I was getting a bunch of error messages and it wasn't working correctly until I turned my computer off. <laughs> <laughs> now that I've turned my computer back on, and I seriously have not done anything other than bring it back up and try it. I was actually brought it back up to reduplicate it to see what the error was so I can go troubleshoot it. Weird. I'm just thinking maybe the environment wasn't really set correctly. Now if I run it, we'll see what this thing does. Brings up a little window, and this is the cool part. It's got six shapes. Wireframe shapes and solid shapes, and they're actually rotating. Nice. It's a sample program that comes if this doesn't work for you. Make sure it works before you start writing programs. Otherwise, your libraries aren't going to be. So this is a nice test. Did you, have you, anyone actually in the class been able to accomplish this yet? No? <laughs> Only one person was here that I recognized. Well, two people were here from the last time when I installed. Did you get this software installed? Have you tried? No? <laughs> All right. Well, it, try it. You, this is what you want to do. This is step number one. Try to see if you can get this, and this is just the sample project. If you go into some of the other projects that are in here, they're all going to be under the multimedia. I actually installed two different libraries. This is the library that I ran through the demo for. You might not have these two. We're going to use GLUT. I'm going to talk about GLUT today. Actually, I started talking about it last time, but I'm going to continue with that lecture. This is, uh, there are two older libraries that are built on GLUT. So this is the one you want to get running. These other ones actually have some sample programs on them, too. Actually, I'll just show you real quick what they look like. Um, and they're just examples. Actually, let's see if they compile. Let's see if we can even get it compiled. 
Oh, it does compile. That's good. This one's got a one shape rotating. And this other one here, I believe, should have uh, something similar. Open glut. It's going to have it. You know, each one of them has like a little sample thing, some library calls. So make sure it's kind of like Hello World. It just makes sure that the uh, library uh, interfaces are actually installed correctly and they can find them. And there you go, look at that. This one's going to give you something like this a little rotating shapes. And uh, you find you find the you can find these through the package. You can check for uh, updates on packages. You can go in here if you missed the last session. You want to go under Dev Packs and check for updates. And the window normally populates. Oh, maybe it's going to do it. Give it a hit. Oh, no. I don't know what happened to the window. Where's the window? Here's the window. There it is. It populated. So the window normally populates with uh, what's available. And I go down to uh, Glut. This is the one I installed last time. I just want to see if OpenGL is still not on here. Python, OpenSSL. Hmm. I don't know where I got those other two libraries then, which is interesting. Uh, but for sure they were part of this. Huh. Yeah, not part of it. Interesting, but this is where you can find that you, what, what you want to install for this class. And the only one you really need for this class is the one that's called Glut. So when you start to do this, get any version of Dev C++ from a different website and follow through the instructions of the last video. When you get to the end of the last video, just cancel it because I get an error message. But uh, at that point, just turn your computer off, turn it back on, and your program should work just fine. So I'm going to close out of here. Don't need to install anything. I already have it installed. Um, so let's take a look here. Don't want to do this one. Uh, let's close this for a second. Go back out. Take a look at the first order of business, which is to kind of go over this assignment here to see what is it that we're doing in this particular course. <laughs> While we're studying computer graphics, we've gone over some basics already. Uh, what we're heading into right now, and the kind of the, the pattern, is to look at OpenGL as a foundation. So the assignment is intended to familiarize yourself with OpenGL and its 3D modeling, viewing, uh, project transformations, uh, projection transformations. And I've talked about the viewing, the modeling, the projections so far, some basic concepts. So you're going to write a program to display an image of an outdoor scene. And the outdoor scene is going to have a windmill and some hills. I know this sounds hard, but it really isn't. Uh, you're going to use both OpenGL or GLUT functions. GLUT is what really you're going to use. You don't have to use OpenGL for this. Um, such as you're going to have GL translate F, GLUT wire cone. Actually, GLUT wire cone was in one of the examples I just showed you. Uh, one of them, actually, the one that had the three, had six shapes on them. Some of them were wire, some of them were solid, and they were spinning. One of them was a cone. Actually, it was a wire cone. And use a mouse keyboard to input the events. I'll show you that actually in the lecture. You also need to have a function as a glue look at and a glue perspective. I'll go over those functions today as well. That's going to set up the view and the projection. So in your project task, you're going to write the program to draw the windmill and some hills. And they're going to be positioned horizontally from the ground plane. And you're going to use the functions glut wire cone cube or cone to construct your scene objects. So you're going to create these objects by using built-in functions. They're not going to look like a windmill and it's not going to look like a hills. <laughs> you're going to have one that's going to look like rolling something and you're going to take a cone and put it on the top of a pole and call it a windmill. <laughs> In fact you could probably spin it quite easily just like just following that, that sample code that's given to you. What you're doing is positioning the objects relative to other objects to make it look like a windmill. It can be as elaborate as you want. Uh, it's pretty difficult to actually get a life-size, excuse me, a like, like, life-like windmill out of this, or life-like hills, unless you do like texture mapping on this, which you don't have to do, 
or you do some uh, really in intricate scene development work. You could spend a year probably making a windmill, I would say. Uh, don't spend that much time. <laughs> Just put uh, you know, a, a pole with a spinning cone on the end of it. Call it a windmill. The idea is just to get you familiar with the concepts of using the um, the GLUT libraries and uh, get your get your programs to compile and sort of get you familiar with it. So you're first going to draw the ground plane. The ground is going to be a flat surface. You know the the plane is going to be on a is the z x z plane it has origin zero zero zero. I'm going to talk about planes in a few. I've talked a little bit about planes already. Uh, the position y axis is the vertic vertical axis. Uh, of this world, the ground plane has dimensions 20 units in the x, going from negative 10 to 10. So you're going, if you think of the number line, you're going uh, from the x axis, you're crossing zero at the midway point. Um, and you have a, essentially, you're drawing a, a grid uh, in spacing. I'm going to draw the xyz axis at the origin. And we actually have, I have some sample code that actually draws that for you, and next week I'll bring in the sample code. So um, I highly encourage you actually to get the software installed, because then you can look at the sample code, and I'm going to give you all of the pieces to put this stuff together. So it's not bad if you can figure out how to use the pieces. So. Um, plus the examples make the lecture stuff make more sense as well. So, And uh, now we have a room with desks and tables. I don't see any power outlets, but <laughs> we can... Easier to use computers in this room, I think, actually. Uh, let's see, you're going to draw the XYZ axis. You're going to select uh, the initial camera location. So you're going to put a camera in there. You're going to draw the windmill, the center axis. The windmill should have two blades perpendicular to each other, forming a cross. Tower of the blades can be modeled up to reconoids or using a glut wire cube. Uh, you can create the hill using a glut wire cone function if you wanted to. Uh, the, the hills, the hills essentially. Um, at least five hills in your scene. So the hills are going to be just you know, hills. <laughs> look like weird hills. <laughs> they could look like cones actually sitting on a flat surface. <laughs> um, you're going to use GL3, color 3 function to display the ground plane, the windmill, the hills, different colors. And to enable the user control of the viewpoint, you're going to write functions to translate the view to go forward, backwards. So when the user clicks on it, you know, the scene will rotate, or you can use it to use the arrows to rotate. And uh, the main keyboard events are going to correspond with the following behavior, the WS keys, or uh, the viewpoint moves forward and back, so you can use the keys to rotate. And imagine those old video games when you use the keys on the keyboard to navigate through the scene which is what you're doing, essentially. And uh, it's all using higher level IP APIs that capture keyboard events. And I have some examples I'll show you to do that. I don't expect you to be able to go home tonight and do this example, or do this homework assignment. It's going to take you a couple weeks to do it, I would think. Um, I mean, you know, after you assemble all the pieces. <laughs> and the main mouse event, left mouse button pressed. So we got keyboard up here we got the mouse information down here in terms of the mouse events and uh, I believe that's the end of the assignment description there's nothing really else in there uh, outside of creating uh, the cones no that's about it and uh, I found this assignment out here and what you're also going to find out here is uh, this is where assignment number one is assignment number two is you're going to find support files out here, but you don't have any support files for assignment number one. Um, instead, what you can use, in fact, there's five assignments for the course, and all of the examples are here. This one here, it says examples to help with assignments. It's going to be a zip file. It's going to have a ton, like almost 100 or so. It's going to have 50 to 100 files in there. Um, a couple of the other source file examples, these are really big archives of a ton of stuff. So once you get your compiler running, all of the examples should work just fine. They were all designed for the um, for this environment, the Dev C++, working with that GLAD library. So hopefully, so you'll be armed and dangerous with examples. Um, hopefully, so I'm gonna minimize this. And last time that you were here, for those of you who were here, we started in talking about OpenGL or GLAD.
And what I kind of want to do is continue along this line so you know what this library is actually doing and you know what it is so you have some ideas about what you're programming. And what we're looking at is an implementation that has been done in C. Or C actually, it can be done in C or C++. I believe I went through this lecture. Did I do image transformation? Do you remember, Tia? Do you remember what I did? Uh, do you remember what lecture I covered last time? I think I did this one. 24. 24? There's no lecture 24. Eight. Oh, 2A. Two, two oh, slide 24 from 2A. <laughs> gotcha. I, did I not cover 2B? I think I covered 2B first and then I started 2A. It helps if someone keeps track, maybe the TA. It would help if you kept track of what, uh, what lecture I've covered. Uh, I, okay, good, good, good. So next time you're going to keep track, right? <laughs> All right. So this is lecture 2A. Okay, so they say I stopped on 24. So let's see. Looking at what OpenGL was, OpenGL features, talked about the concept of text or mapping, Z buffering, double buffering, lighting effects, smooth shading, dullness, shininess. I talked about all this stuff. Transformation metrics. Are you sure this is the right lecture? I think it was 2B24. 2B24? 2A24. 2B this is 2A. Were you here last week? This is 2B. This is 2B? This is 2A. Slide 24? Yeah. 2B4, let's see. What is on slide 24? I don't think it was this, really. It may have been this. Let's see. You're going to have to... Are you going to make me... This was this. This was it. Yeah. Yeah. We were here, weren't we? Yes. Well, we didn't do 26. We stopped about here. GL functions. You were here last time. You you would be able to tell me. Okay, good. So some of these do seem a little clues. As if we didn't go over this, I'm going to take a brief tour through this. <laughs> Not to spend too much time reviewing what we've already covered. But this is lecture 2A. It is a uh, pretty lengthy, and it goes through a lot of information. It talks about OpenGL and the GLUT libraries and what it contains. And what we're looking at is an API that for which a lot of other APIs are built from. This is the lower level API. So VR, VRML, um, the Android development API, and a bunch of the other APIs are built off of OpenGL. So you're going down to the bottom of the source. It is not object oriented. It works with C or C++, but it works with functions, no classes, no methods. It is bunch of functions that we're running at a lower level implementation. So it's development, uh, so let's see, we, we, I, I know I've talked about this already, rendering and image, low level graphics rendering and imaging library is what this is, it's the OpenGL. And it uh, works with IBM, the Mac, the OS X, it's cross-platform compatible, it doesn't rely upon the MFC or the JFC or anything. It's it's, it's a, a, uh, built upon lower level constructs and most of it's assembly language and C type implementation. Gives us texture mapping and Z buffering and double buffering and I actually I, I do remember I talked about this stuff. <laughs> so, and uh, lighting effects to enable lighting and specify the lights and the materials and the solid lighting and smooth lighting and give us that realism that we get with uh, graphics. And I remember because we talked about the RGB scale as well uh, and the ability to specify colors. The transformation, the ability to change the location to rotate an image in the XYZ plane to turn it upside down, look at the back, to look at the front. And going back to some of the rendering comments on that was do we render the entire object, just the visible part of the object? Do we buffer the whole object? in the scene, we just, you know, we, do we apply a double buffer where we have it ready? We've buffered the entire thing, but what we're only showing is we have it ready to buffer it again if we need to, to show the back part of something. And the same way that the G GDI graphic device interface works, we have the OpenGL, which is a program that makes an OpenGL call. It used to be, these are the old names, OpenGL32, then we had Glue32 DLLs that were loaded. 
It's a different way of doing it, loading on Windows DLLs. There's many different APIs. Glut is the underneath all that stuff, <laughs> which is why we're using that. Limitations of the OpenGL, Microsoft generic implementation, hmm. no support for printing. Actually, we still don't have any printing available. So all that stuff you saw a few minutes ago, the real rotating stuff, is not going to print well. I'm not going to show up nicely at all. Uh, Four-bit planes of colors, yeah, monochrome printers, they can't really show you all the color combinations, nor can it show you the shading or uh, any of the detail. Hardware palettes vary from Windows that are not supported. In fact, computers will vary. Your images on your screen are going to look different than the images that show up on my screen because of the hardware, uh, hardware differences. Features are not implemented, including uh, stereoscoping images, auxiliary buffering. Some stuff is not implemented. Um, I did not go through the history. I probably skipped this stuff, actually. Uh, OpenGL, 1992. I went over this already. Easy to use, stuff like that. Controlled by the Architectural Review Board, the ARB, uh, which is continuously updating it. The Glue Library provides the functionality of the core of the OpenGL, but avoids having to rewrite some of the code. It actually has some higher level um, libraries built into it. So, The GLUT library is the OpenGL utility library that provides the functionality common for all windowing systems. So GLUT is more cross-platform compatible than some of the OpenGL 32s and the OpenGL windows and other different versions of it. It opens a window and initializes the OpenGL state. It gets the input from the keyboard, from the mouse, has menus, you can do, it's menu driven. Uh, the code is portable, but GLUT lacks the functionality of a good toolkit for specific platforms. So GLUT is, is the under base that's done in like maybe for example the Android development stuff where we've got more controls for the, the wheel and for uh, the number pad and all of the other features of the UI. Not officially part of the OpenGL library, however. So. You guys are in the computer graphics class as well? Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> okay, so I guess that email worked. <laughs> so many people. OpenGL functions. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Alright, so let's take a look at some of the functions that are associated with it in terms of primitives. Points, line segments, and polygons. Attributes, transformations, that's going to be the viewing and the modeling, and then the control mechanism. And then the input, which is done through GLUTs. And the input is the mouse input, the keyboard input, things of that nature. OpenGL is also a state machine. Uh, so we've got concept of uh, there being a, a, a loop or an environment for which the objects exist in and the window just stays open. And uh, there's two different types. We have the primitive generating and then the state changing. So you can cause the output in a primitive to be visible. Uh, you can have vertices and processes that appear. Appearances of primitives that are controlled by the state, whether the object is moved to the left or the right in orientation with other objects. And then we have the state changing, transformation functions and attribute functions that also exist. We have a lack of object orientation. Yes, we do. As I mentioned previously at the beginning of this lecture, no object orientation support. It's not a C++ thing. It's really a C thing. You can use a C++ compiler, however. In fact, GC, uh, I was going to say GCC, but this, this um, compiler, the dev C++, is based off of GNUC, GCC. So it actually will install a generic C compiler for you. you call itself C++. If you want to program with classes, you can actually create C++ <coughs> classes. However, OpenGL is not object-oriented, so that there's multiple different functions for a given logical function, which is kind of weird. So here's what you run into. You get different functions that all start out the same, and then they have the last three characters are different, or the last two characters might be different. And this is for the different types of the different objects that you're running. And to create an object, you run a function. And the function looks similar like this. All the functions start out GL. This is kind of where you might as well just take away the GL. It's gonna, you know, everything starts out GL. Vertic, vertex 3F, vertex 2I is going to give me something different than 3DV. 
you know. So underlying storage model is the same. Easy to create overloaded functions in C++, but issue is efficiency in terms of overloading. You don't want to overload these functions if if you want to retain their specific um, their specific meaning in terms of why they were created. So we have different, and it seems most likely what ends up happening is when we start looking at the library calls and when I, after I get done with here I'm going to go back to my Windows program and I'll show you some of the functions in that sample program and you'll go, oh look at that, I recognize that. <laughs> and it's usually this the last part of the character, the last three digits of the character here and I'll go through that in a few minutes on the command notation. That's going to differentiate some things. So nobody, just like learning another programming API, nobody memorizes all the commands. Instead, what you do is you go, well, there's a function call for that. Well, which function do I want? And then you figure out, well, I want the GAL sum function. But what do I want on the end? It depends on the features that you want. So instead of taking on an argument list, the arguments are part of the function name, which is why we have so many functions. <laughs> It would have been easier, I think, to write this in an object-oriented fashion. To have an object that created something and then have 25 different variations of that same object and have one make into the other, make an whole entire hierarchy of this. But this was created back in the 90s, late 80s, when object orientation wasn't around. And it's still pretty strong and still pretty well accepted. So here's how you read the functions. Because what is going to happen is you're going to start looking online. You're going to go, I need a function to create a cone. Well, I got a wire cone. I got a you know, solid cone. I got a this cone. I got a that cone. How, what am I going to do with this thing? So here's the code. Here's the number coding system in the most important slide. Actually, the next slide as well. But the most important couple of slides in the entire lecture for today. How to identify the file, excuse me, the function that you want to use and how to pick the right function. The first option term in the curly brackets here indicates that this function takes three arguments. <laughs> so we know there's some, some function three that's here. This is one of the ob this is what's going to appear in the name. So hello. My computer's thinking too much. I tried to go back a slide and I have no ability to navigate. Ah, there we go. Three, two, three. <laughs> Tells us how many parameters the sucker's going to take. The second set of the brackets indicates that the function takes five possible arguments. One, two, three, four, five. Corresponding with a byte, a short, an integer, a float, or a double. Ah, so kind of counterintuitive. Normally we would see that somewhere else, like in a function prototype or something. <laughs> which you can get lists of function prototypes. But this is going to tell us the data type. So the second set is going to indicate the function that takes five possible argument types, which is going to be, the, for those people who know about something about data types, it's the data type of the argument that you're going to take for the parameter. And then the last term, our third bracket, indicates the vector form of the command, which also exists if there is one. But there doesn't have to be one. It could be a V left off. So it's it's whether or not there's a V is going to give us the vector form of the command. And here we go, here's an example. This is one of them that we saw in the previous slide. So the number of arguments, three, which means we're going to have an X, Y, and a Z. And the number of arguments is it's going to be X, Y, two plane, three plane, or four. We're going to have X, Y, Z, W, X, Y, Z, or just X, Y. That's the three. The data type here is F. So this one is going to be a float, double integer. And all of these look the same, but there's different combinations of the last three characters at the end. <laughs> and then V, omitted V for scalar form, or V put in for vector. Which is kind of the, the numbering system. So now when you start looking at, don't be confused by all of the different functions you're going to see in the code example I'm going to give you. It just means where the argument types are going to be required to be a certain way. So header files. My files only got one. I believe it has let in it, actually. Let's see if I can do it. Oops. No. Oops. All right. It was slide number 29. Let's 
relate this to something and actually can flip back and forth. can zoom this guy in too. Mm -hmm. I probably should just let that one up. Mm -hmm. the comments at the beginning here so you can kind of see code. If you're going to use Dev C++ and you're going to download it, you're going to do it the way I did it. You're going to have GL instead of OpenGL. It's going to be GL. But if you install a third-party library because you don't want to use this and you want to take it the hard way and use Microsoft Visual C++, it might say OpenGL. Actually, it's what I was going to say. Or it's going to say something else. My include is going to be glut.h and this is the standard library here. And uh, so in the lecture, that's essentially what that's referring to. Make this smaller again. So GL, what's the last option is what we're going to do. Enumeration types for platforms, sometimes it's say GL short, GL byte. Ours are going to be uh, lower GL, probably GL short, GL byte in terms of the enumeration types. These are just going to be different types for different platform support. Ours are going to be generic because we're not using a platform specific library. This will work on multi platforms. So, a float. Because if you think about the concept, uh, a float is a float on one computer, is a different float on a different computer <laughs> in terms of the definition of the operating system. So, if you want to make it multi compatible, we've got is GL enumerations, where there's nothing more than a GL version of a byte and a GL version of a short things of that nature. So we have the defines at the beginning here. So OpenGL defines most constants are defined in the, the include file here. So if we open that up, so not the note include the h, the glut.h should automatically include the others, hopefully. So you shouldn't have to uh, include anything. Examples of the uh, predefined constants that are going to be in these header files are going to be uh, the GL begin, the GL clear, all of the different definitions that we can use. So we can just run these definitions that will run the function calls for us. So we can include files also in open GL data types for GL float, GL double, things of that nature. But right now I would worry, not worry about any of the special includes that you could possibly do or the files that are also being included. Um, until you find something that doesn't work and you read the documentation, it says, oh, you need a particular library. So, so now what I'm going to do is kind of go through a sample program and generate a square on a solid background. The simplest GL program you could possibly come up with. Simpler than the example they give you in the hello world. So, so here's our code. <laughs> so I think this is probably, uh, let's see, make it a little bigger. There we go. Oh, look at that, we got it bigger. So just like the other code I showed you, um, we've got a void my display. There's the problem with this not being in PowerPoint is the uh, underlining, the strange underlining that occurs. You know what? Here. Just do something real quick. Make my life easier. I'll just put it up on the full screen again. What I'm going to do is go through the different parts of this program as soon as I can get back to the program. <laughs> I went too far. There we go. Here's our simple.c. You may cut and paste this code, put it into a simple.c file, and bring it up in your compiler. Your, uh, and uh, it'll run just fine. And uh, the main parts of the program, here we have it right here. We've got a my display, which is going to be a function that's going to be run from, um, well, from main that is uh, going to be set up in terms of putting a polygon on the screen with vertexes. So we have x, y, x, y, x, y, x, y, because we know we have the number two here, and these are float values here. And this is not a vector, so it's missing the v on the end. And uh, which is going to give us our definition. One of the recurring things you're going to see is the gl clear and the gl begin function. 
gel begin function for gel polygon is a predefined defined shape actually. And what you're going to find is we're going to have many different defined shapes that already exist and it's a matter of just following a template for putting the things in the right order and then all of a sudden you've drawn the shape and then you can apply other things to it like coloring and stuff like that. And uh, in the main program we create the window we run the function and then we create a, what's called a state machine or a loop as I mentioned before where OpenGL, NGL, GLUT programs run in what's called a state machine. And a state machine is, is created automatically by calling main loop. And main loop just does nothing more than loop it, loop it, loop it, loop it. So in the old days when you want to create a state machine, you like a do while or something. You create a do while loop, you say, you know, or while, you know, while x is equal to 5, do all this code. And at the end, it says loop, continue go back up to the top, and then once you change to 5, the program stopped. Instead of actually having to build a loop in, in an OpenGL program, it's automatically assumed when you do glut main loop that you intend to loop. So you're, this program is going to loop on its own. We don't have to worry about it. Otherwise, what ends up happening in a normal program is it would bring up the window, paint it, and then shut the window. <laughs> Program's over with. So this program never actually ends until you exit or you close the window. Which means you could put a object out there, you could put a couple objects out there. And then you can put the mouse over it, you can move the objects around perhaps if you build the functionality into the scene. The scene can change with other information that might be coming in, which you can populate. So you could build, for example, a graph or a plot or something that's you know constantly monitoring network traffic as an example and showing you the number of students who are logged on and stuff like that and kind of create uh, you know a live running program essentially that constantly gets updated. So the event loop. Note that the program defines a display callback function and this is called a callback function. So my display is a callback function and that is being done with glut display function my display. You don't have to do it this way actually. This is one preferred method of doing it because you've separated this all out into a function. So every GLUT program must have a display callback if you're going to follow this pattern. And I was going to say this, although this, this slide set is going to say it must have this, it must have that, it must do this, must. and then this, thing, this line of thinking to follow this template in terms of the program design, it should have it, yes it must have it. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't have it, it's not going to work properly. There's other ways of designing the GLUT interface. But let's just take this as the template for right now. So the callback function, my display, every GLUT program is going to, GLUT program is going to have one. The GLUT callback is executed whenever OpenGL decides the display must be refreshed. Uh, for example, when the window is open, when the window moves, when the window gets resized, the callback function is going to actually be performed. So the main function ends with the program entering into the event loop. That's this event loop here, main loop. So we have the callback function. We have the simple create window. This little line of code right here draws the window that we saw and puts simple in the, uh, the title bar. That's one line of code to create a window. <laughs> Not too bad. So we don't have to do MSC programming. We don't have to actually use any Microsoft Foundation classes to create a window to do a bunch of the graphic GUI stuff. So if you're trained like that, then um, it's, uh, it's easy, uh, easier, much easier than experienced with. If you're not trained, then you can quickly create graphics programs using GLUT without knowing anything about other types of computer graphics. So some developed information, the simple.c is too simple, makes heavy use of state variables, default values for viewing, colors, window parameters. We haven't said any of that stuff. All we've said is basically a window, and on the window we put that rectangle out there. And that rectangle is that shape that showed up in the beginning here. So the program that we created looks like that. It's nothing more than a square and a solid background. So we can apply some other more sophisticated t things to it. In fact, the next version I was going to have defaults more explicit. So we can change the viewing angle, change the colors, and the window parameters. So the main program here, we begin with the basic elements of how to create a window. 
And the OpenGL is intentionally designed to be independent of any specific windowing system, as I mentioned before. So that one line of code that created the window is not creating one for the Mac. It's not creating one for the Windows. It's just creating a generic OpenGL window. And uh, as a result, a number of basic window operations are not provided, which means we can't put, like, you know, the opening and the closing, the, the, the red. We can't, like, put change the motif of the window, put the open, the closing, the minimizing, and all of the other behavior, the scroll bars and other things that you might be associated with, uh, might, might be familiar with. Therefore, a separate library uh, called GLET or OpenGL Utility Toolkit creates, uh, that provides these functions. So one explanation for why we have GLET, we have OpenGL, we have GL, we have all these different libraries is they all contain different subsets of different features that you can add to your program. Let's basic. If you download and install OpenGL, you're going to get more toolkits, but then you're going to get more specific to different platforms. So you have an OpenGL library for Windows. You have an OpenGL for the Mac. You have OpenGL for... You have one GLUT for everything, but you have different wrappers. If you want to call it a wrapper on top of that. It's going to give you more higher functions and more utility toolkits for different windowings. So basic let provides the necessary tools for requesting windows to be created and providing their actions on the I.O. devices. So let's take a look at the program structure. So this is hello world of OpenGL that we're going through. And uh, looking at the same example. Uh, so most OpenGL programs have similar structures that consist of the following functions. We have main, we might have init, and we have callbacks. As I mentioned before, the callback function was the display one. So main defines the callback functions, and it opens one or more windows with the required properties. So we, we did one of each. We defined the callback, and we also opened up one window. And then we entered into the loop at the end. So the last execution statement was entering into that loop. And it sets the state variables for viewing and attributes. We haven't really set very many of those in our first version. And then the callback is the display function. We actually called it display function. The input and the windowing functions, which are also separated out, which we didn't actually define. So here's our different parts of somebody talking on the phone. <laughs> and it is freezing in here. I apologize for that. Next week is going to be warmer. <laughs> so I am freezing to death. Um, Here's our main program as an example. We are including gl.h up here. Our main, this is actually kind of the same main function you'd see in any other C program, actually. In it, that it would be a replacement for this. We don't need this unless we're going to get input. If we're going to get the keyboard, the mouse input, we're going to need the edit function. The display mode, we didn't set the display mode, but we could. In that other example, the window size, the window position, we didn't set any of that, actually. Display mode by default is going to be an RGB if we don't set it. Uh, the create the window simple, which we did, and the glut display function, which is our display callback. So our callback function is essentially our main function that's going to generate the graphic that we're going to show on the screen. And then in it, just set the open GL state, and then glut main loop enters the event loop. So this program example here has all of the pieces put in it of the basic what I want to call standard template. So what you're going to do is you're going to cut and paste this, put it into a C file, compile it, and maybe fill in the body of this uh, My Display. And you could use this for your first assignment. And your My Display is going to build a windmill. <laughs> it's going to build some trees or some hills on the plane. You're going to be a little bit more specific about the viewing, perhaps. You're going to be more specific about the objects. You create more than one object. I'm going to scare. Allow, uh, maybe provide some lighting. And then you're going to use the init because you're going to, excuse me, the input because you're going to want to take mouse and keyboard stuff. And I've got some examples that I'm going to show you next week as well. It's going to show you input. So the glut functions here, glut init, allows the application to get the command line arguments and initialize the system. Glut init in the beginning here was used to take on those command line arguments and as a pass through from main. So, uh, in fact, it's not even required to have it up here. You can just have main without it. In fact, I don't know if my main here here had it either. But I didn't. don't think I had... Uh, oh, I did have it here. Okay. But I didn't have... Uh, this was a very stripped out version of it. So, 
That was the bare minimum. Uh, the init display mode request properties of the window. So we could set the RGB to single buffering, uh, which is by default anyway. Properties logical. Ord together, all of the different parameters that we might want to pass to the display mode. Uh, the GLET window size in pixels, window position, create a window function itself with a title simple, the callback function, the infinite loop on the bottom, those are the generic functions. And uh, you're going to see these over and over and over again. And by listening to me describe them to you, you're not going to learn anything. By cutting and pasting this and putting it into a program and playing around with it, leaving something out, and then you'll figure out, oh, that's why it's needed. <laughs> and then you'll learn. And then every program you create will look pretty boring. Right now they're looking at this going, I don't know how I'm going to put this together. But after you try it a couple of times, you'll go, it's the same thing over and over again. Every program has the same format to it. It's using the same function calls. It's the same thing. One graphic program looks like all the rest of them, except for the objects are different. The viewing is different. You set a different view tone to it. And if you were using one of the higher level APIs that was written on top of GLUT, you would be running even more functions on top of that, but you'd have to remember less functions, fewer number of functions. You'd just be basically running higher, higher level functions. So let me go through some of these in a little bit more detail so you know what it is these functions are doing. The GLUT in it, the arguments allow the application to get the command line arguments. As I mentioned before, it's sort of a pass through on main from the main C program, I, you know, I take that back, the comment I said about not having to be able to put that in. I believe you have to actually, re you have to put this in in order to grab the command line, put it into, uh, these are grabbing the arguments off of the command line and putting it into an array structure and keep keeping track of the number of arguments that were actually entered. And if you're not familiar with this concept, uh, pick up a Deedle and Deedle how to program in C book. And that will help you. It's basic basic format for taking in command line arguments. Command line arguments is when you type in the name of the program space something space something the space something and the space something are command line arguments. They're going to be read into the program and used inside of the program somehow. And usually they're set for you know copy like cp space file 1 file 2 <laughs> and you're going to take file 1 and copy it to file 2 essentially inside of the program which is essentially what you're doing here. But sometimes you might want to go you know Build, build a windmill red comma blue, and you're going to make a red and blue windmill or something. Uh, the procedure must be called uh, before any of the others are called because it has to actually do the pass through from the main. It's usually at the top of the program. It processes and removes command line arguments uh, that may be of interest to GLUT and the winning system, and does uh, does general initialization on the process. So here's our init display mode, and this box is actually kind of giving you some of the options, so the display mode and then the meaning that's associated with it. So on, the, on our example, we saw RGB, I believe, being used, which is going to be our red, green, and uh, blue uh, color scale, which is pretty generic. Um, so the function performs the initialization performing in the OpenGL how to set the frame bumper, buffer all of the other parts of it, so the arguments essentially are going to be... Um, separated, so the logical and or operator, the number of possible options that could be created, which might be use RGB colors and use RGB colors plus, or use this one or use that one. And it basically starts at the beginning of the list, and if it can use it, it uses it. If it can't use it, it uses something else. Because here's what happens, you write one graphic program, then you run it on five different computers, and one's going to support it, one's not. So if it supports it, use it. Otherwise, you select a bunch of other options. So you, you give it the logical and ors to, in terms of the display mode settings to tell it um, that these are the options that are available to you. And here you see it here. GLUT single or GLUT RGB, which you're separating the, you're separating the parameters by the logical and ors. The and might be the, is the ampersand, the or is the line, which is what you get in the other um, C programming kind of things. So the window size is going to give us the window size. It's a command that specifies the desired width and height of the graphical window. 
So we have the integer width, comma, integer height as the function. So the general form of the function. Most people can understand this one quite clearly. The values are given in numbers of pixels, which is kind of interesting because you have to have to figure out you have to do like a little pixel conversion to see how big that window wants. To, you want that window to look. The position is going to orient it on the screen. If you don't do anything, it's going to take the default windowing system. My when Microsoft Windows so that I'm running on here, the XP, puts it in the center of the screen. So that box opens up, it goes in the center. You might not want it in the center. So you can specify the coordinates of the integer X and the integer Y for the orientation on the 2D display. Uh, so the command specifies the location of the upper left-hand corner of the graphic window. XY coordinates are given relative to the upper left-hand corner of the display. That's the argument 0, 0. Places the window at the upper corner of the display at 0 position. So. And hopefully at this point we know XY and XYZ the difference, 2D and 3D. So XY is a 2D display, XYZ is our 3D. And we're doing 3D graphics in this class, so we have XYZ. <laughs> In our XYZ plane, I have an, a really good example if I remember to show it to you next time. Because I, can't, I have to go find it. I have to go look for it in all those zip files. Um, there's one that actually shows the XYZ plane, and then you can orient it, and it shows you the position of your cursor in the plane, which is helpful. So you load this program up, and you use it to get your coordinates that you're typing in to put your objects in the display. So it's a nice utility to get the coordinates that you're interested in getting. Because it's really hard to tell your XYZ coordinates. Which is one of the interesting things. And so a lot of people, even for like say RGB scale, uh, ASCII conversion of those numbers, is who walks around like an encyclopedia knowing all the codes for that. <laughs> so you get one of those palette programs, and I have one of those in one of these sample programs too. You run the, put the mouse cursor over it. Oh, I like that shade of blue. Ooh, a little darker, a little high. And then it gives you the correlating color code that goes along with that from the RGB scale. Okay, here it is where the title of the character string here. Oops, I already went to the next one, didn't I? Uh, position, so the title is the title, obviously. So here's the title of the, is a string. And each window has a title. It's about all it has, really. And the argument of the string uh, is the window's title. And then here we have init C as an example. Void init. It's a little simple little program that's going to initialize. We have a black clear color, it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 opaque window, 1.0, give us the opaque. So the clear color, the color 3 floats, so we know we have 3, we have floats, X, Y, Z, 1, 1, 1, to fill it in with white. So uh, the matrix mode projection, we'll talk about that in a few, uh, load the identity, load the ortho. The viewing volume. So it's going to have different parameters. So essentially, what ends up happening is you get familiar with what parameters go from what positions from the XYZ coordinates and then what color scale you're looking at. And here is our coordinate system. <laughs> so the units of, uh, of NAGL vertex, which is that little V that shows up at the end, if you're going to use a vertex. Uh, vector, actually, is what that piece for, um, are determined by the application of what we call the world or the problem coordinates. So sometimes the word world comes up in a lot of literature uh, versus the word scene. You can actually tell the graphics people because they use world. <laughs> the world is the XYZ coordinate. It's everything that's inside of it, which is in the scene. So. The scene is the orientation from the user's perspective. The world is the graphic environment of the XYZ coordinate. So we place objects in the world and we rotate the world to create the scenes. So that's how we get objects to move throughout the scene, objects to animate, objects to disappear, to reappear, stuff like that. The viewing specifications are also in the world coordinates. It's the size of the viewing volume that determines what will appear in the image. So internally, OpenGL converts to camera coordination, coordinates and later to screen coordinates. We have camera view and then we have scene views, which is kind of interesting because we can, we can change the camera view and we can all of a sudden get the forward or the backward or the top or the bottom of the particular scene or the world that we're trying to interesting in seeing. So here's our OpenGL camera perspective. Places camera at the origin point in the negative Z direction. Then the default viewing volume of this box is centered at the origin 
with a side of length 2. Actually, the default, if you just create, and we'll see this in the example, if we do the x, y, z coordinate, the default view is actually at the zero axis. So this is the default view. We see it right here, which is different than if we rotate it and we see the right side, the left side. So it's really head on is the default view. So what ends up happening is depending upon the coordination of the coordinates that you're setting of the camera view, you might end up with a different scene view. So, and you define your scene by your camera, essentially. My people. Orthographic viewing. So actually, this is a better, better representation of this. So in the default, the orthographic view points are projected forward, as I mentioned before, along the z-axis onto the z is equal to zero. So it's on the zero points. So x, y, x, y, zero for the z which is pretty flat. It's almost a 2D, actually, because you have the zero here. So you're looking at the x, x y coordinate. That's going to give us our orientation on the flat surface. So we change the value, and then we can rotate it. So transformations and viewing deal with the rotation. So all you got to do is take and rotate this scene on the z-axis, and then all of a sudden you are able to to see the 3D rotation and the transformation. So you can get somebody walking, you can get somebody, uh, you can basically create animation. You can also create movement in the, in the scene. So an OpenGL, the projection is carried out by what's called a projection matrix, which is referred to also as a transformation. So sometimes the math people like to call a matrix. It's a projection matrix. It really is. But the graphic people call it a transformation. <laughs> Yeah, which is kind of the same thing. Uh, so there's only one set of transformation functions, and we set the we must set the matrix mode first. So matrix mode to GL projection, and once we have that, we can set the transformation. Transformation functions are incremented, so we can start with the identical matrix and then alter it with a projection matrix that gives a view volume. So we set the original coordinate, and then we multiply We increment each one of the values by something, or we decrement it by something, and then all of a sudden we can rotate. Think about it. So, so two- and three-dimensional viewing, which is how we're getting that. Uh, so in the GL ortho, left, right, bottom, top, near and far. The near and the far, and this is, this is going back to uh, these coordinates, left, right, near far. This is basically defining these positions here. Because you're most people look at this and go, how do you know what to set the numbers to? <laughs> numbers are corresponding to left, right, top, bottom, near and far. And if you mess the order up, you end up with an uh, interesting pos positioning. You will never end up with an error if you put the right values in and you actually include in this particular case so uh, one, two, three, four, five, six parameters, you're gonna end up with the right with a, with a compilable program that might not show you what it is you expected to see. So the near and the far distances are measured from the camera, which is interesting because then you have to assume that you've put a camera in there and two-dimensional vertices places, uh, places all the vertices at the plane zero. So two dimension, as I mentioned before, the z is zero. So just remember that. If it's just an x, y and you leave it a zero, you've got a two-dimensional. Although you're using a 3D object, you're only showing it a two-dimensional. Uh, the application is in two-dimensional, but we can use the function ortho td for left, right, bottom, top if we wanted to. And rather than setting those other values to zero in a two-dimensional viewing, or the clipping volume because a clipping window. So this is going to render more information than this, and this is going to take longer if you're using a 3D function and you're only using it in two-dimensional mode. And you're only providing it with certain values, it's better to use the 2D one because you're going to be rendering less information, processing less information. Uh, so here's an example here of setting the color. Uh, so we have the color buffer bit. Creating the polygon. This is what we're doing in terms of the GL begin polygon. And we have two float vertices, one, two, three, four vertices of the polygon to set the one, two, three, four um, corners. Then we end the GL, begin, GL end, and then flush. So it's C programming. It sort of looks to me like Pascal, kind of. reminds me of Pascal. We go begin, end. <laughs> we begin a procedure to define a polygon, and then we end the procedure, which is kind of interesting. So, 
And then the flush is interesting because it's, it's, it's basically flushing the temporary buffer of all the information that we've kept, and it's making more memory for us. So clearing out the memory. So here's some OpenGL primitives to kind of think about. Uh, the polygon, which is, uh, you know, it depends on how many vertices we want. The line loop, the lines, the geo line is just the line, the point. So you got to go back to geometry. I go, well, point, two points equal a line. I mean, the line strips. Remember, we can take lines of strips, lines, triangles, triangle strips, triangle fans, triangle quad strips. <laughs> so we got triangles that are uh, quad strips, excuse me, not triangle strips, but quads. Um, and then uh, these would be the primitive shapes. On the primitive shapes, we have a bunch of higher level shapes that are created from the primitives. This is where we're getting the cones and uh, all of the other shape objects that we're going to see. So polygon issues. In fact, everything is converted into polygons, if you think about it. OpenGL will only display polygons correctly that are simple. Edges cannot cross. Convert a convex, excuse me, all points of the line segment between the two points in the polygon are also in the polygon itself. If they're flat, all, all vertices are in the same plane. Uh, and the user program must check if the above is true. If not, it will compile just fine, but it's not going to look right. <laughs> it won't draw the shape correctly, but it will compile just fine. So it's a programmer is really going to check to make sure all of that stuff is followed correctly. Triangle satisfy all of the conditions non-simple polygon, here's a non-convex polygon, the star. Attributes. Attributes are part of the uh, OpenGL library itself, determining the appearance of the objects. The attributes might be on color, points, lines, and polygons have colors to them. Size and width of points and lines, width of a line, um, size of a point. Stripped patterns for lines and polygons, polygon mode. Display all of the filled solid polygons or stripped patterns or display the edges. You can actually display the polygons inside of the polygons. Depends on what attribute you use. And then we have the formal word, the use of the wrapper. I called it a Pascal program earlier. It's really called a wrapper. And where we have a, a begin and an end, a GL begin, a, be, a GL end. We have stuff in between that wraps it, creates the object that we're beginning. And all OpenGL descriptions or primitives start with a begin with an object, so it's defined constant that identifies the OpenGL primitive. And here we had a polygon, I think, in the beginning. Here, let's see. Begin GL polygon. And polygon is the wrapper. So this is essentially the wrapper that's defining the GL polygon that we're creating in this particular example. And we're not, we don't actually have to call it anything. We don't even give it a variable or something. So it's kind of like C programming, but it's a little different. It's following a slightly different type of, you know, it's written in C, but it's a, almost a separate language in itself, if you think about it. Uh, so it's not using, like, standard func. I mean, you're, you're calling functions, but you're not using, like, even standard function calls, if you think about it. Um, so we have the wrappers specifying primitives. So we have the X, Y, the Z, and the W. So we have the window. So the primitives are uh, described by their vertices. The vertex is the point in the space uh, which is used to construct the geometric primitive, described by the homogeneous coordinates, the homogeneous coordinates of the plane. This one ends up becoming the most difficult part of figuring out the transformation metrics. When we start doing the metrics, then we take one metric and we increment the entire metrics by two, shift it, um, shift part of it. And then we end up with interesting transformations that occur. So, specifying the OpenGL vertices, vertex, excuse me, recall the OpenGL specified geometry vertex by its vertices. Here we have three floats, x, y, z. So, different primitives require a different number of vertices. Bleh, I can talk. Here's a drawing point example where we have beginning GL points. And so this is a word wrap of the uh, comment selection point as the primitive. The selection point point, this is the point we're selecting as the primitive. We're specifying a point, three floats, zero, 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 specifying another point, and now we're done drawing the points. <laughs> so this is 
essentially the two points that we created that are going to give us our GL points. Setting the point size, so we can go point size, GL float size, so store support, so you can say size is two, and we can do a float to increment the step, and then we can um, essentially use it to get supported point size ranges and increment the steps of the points to, by two. So get float, float ver, uh, vector, GL point size range, sizes, GL point granularity, a matter of a function called incremented by steps, which is going to be the value that we're going to use for that. Actually drawing something. <laughs> so here's an OpenGL sequence to draw the square that's centered around the origin. So GL quads, squares. And, and then, yeah, just basically get familiar with what you're going to call these primitives. And the primitives all have names. And most people who get into this, they buy the books, you know, the OpenGL books, or they download it from the internet. You print out the charts of all the names of all the primitives and all the, and then you go, oh, what is that? And you just start experimenting with it and you figure out, oh, that's a quad. Okay. And here's our four points of it and there's the end. So it's just basically drawing it around the center. Positioning the point. If you position one of the points wrong, it doesn't come out right. <laughs> How do you position the points? Oh, that's kind of the tricky part. <laughs> that takes the practice. Adding personality to primitives, we have the state or the attributes, the data required for computing colors for primitives. Uh, this one didn't actually have color in it, just turned out to be yellow on the screen. Doesn't have to be yellow, it could be some other color. Uh, the color could be uh, examples color reflectiveness, which is kind of interesting. It can make it dull, shiny, different shades of shiny. Surface texture that you might be able to apply to it. Specifying the color and uh, what I'll do is I'll just kind of go through these attributes and then I'll, I'll probably end after that because this is kind of information overload if it's brand new to you. Uh, so use the OpenGL color, the RGB scale. Most people are familiar with that from other graphics programming classes. Uh, when you specify the color determines how the primitive is going to be shaped. A point only gets one color. It's the combination. So here's the main program here, and we got the window size is 512 by 512, and the display mode is going to be GLET RGB, RGB scale, and here we're going to create a window, my window, in it. So some of the stuff might start looking familiar to you, maybe. And we're going to go, the, dis, the display function, our callback function is going to draw a screen, and now we're going to have another function that's going to say draw a screen. And the draw a screen function, uh, actually after we're going to have a main loop here, we're going to use the init routine uh, for our one time, for this one time. OpenGL state initialization. So the call after the window has been created, but before the first rendering call, our void init is going to set the color for us. So our init is going to run init, and init is going to say clear color. Uh, this is going to be the color combination. And then we're going to draw, let's say, uh, lines in the 3D mode by specifying two points. And here's the line strip, actually. So we get vertice 0, vertice 1, it's defined by these two coordinate points. And then we can draw more if we wanted to, put a third point in there. So we build it up, so we're drawing. Now we're drawing in 3D. And we've got that 0, 1, 2. And then we can connect the lines and we can create shapes out of them. Setting the line width. We've been using default width color, which is probably set to one. I'm not quite sure. We can set the design. We can set the width to different sizes so that the width actually gets drawn uh, heavier. Supported wide ranges of sizes. So basically, you just set set the width size when you create the line. So choose the fastest primitive for performance tips. Most 3D acceleration hardware is highly optimized for drawing of triangles. It's actually kind of interesting, depending upon the primitive that you select to use, um, if you draw things manually, connecting lines together and filling them in, it's going to take longer than if you just use the primitive for a triangle. Just create the triangle. So. And the interesting thing is there's no right, right or wrong way of doing it. In fact, you'll find in even more advanced kind of examples, what you're mostly concerned with is efficiency. How fast is it going to draw? And how much processing time is it going to take? Because you don't want a slow running graphics program. Winding the combination of the order and the direction in which the vertices are specified and to the left and to the right. So clockwise or counterclockwise. Counterclockwise or clockwise. 
back facing and winding front facing, which is what that's referring to. So the default considerations for polygons have a clock counterclockwise winding in the front facing. Why so important? So you can hide the back of the polygons altogether. So you can get it in different colors, reflective properties as well. And when we want to hide it, basically there's less rendering. So if you paint it in a certain way, whatever, it doesn't show vis visibly in the plane and it's hidden on the back, it doesn't get rendered. It doesn't get rendered, it doesn't take up that much processing time, it paints faster. So we can do a front face, so it changes the default winding to that way, or clockwise, counterclockwise. Triangle strips. Here's the uh, kind of the, some of the interesting things with the triangle strips. They're just essentially taking this coordinate system, doing a calculation on it, and the calculation creates this coordinate system and it fills it in. And then another calculation and you strip it in a certain direction and it creates it from one end to the other end, so particular width. And uh, this is a form of transformation, actually. You're taking the coordinate system and you're translating it into a new coordinate system and multiplying it or, excuse me, adding it to the original one and stripping it out. Triangle fans is an example kind of done in a very similar fashion. Uh, with triangles that are fans, instead of triangle strips, they're fanning in a different direction. So they're creating, instead of going in a straight line, they're going in a curved line more of a fan or circle with it. So setting polygon colors. Colors are specific for vertice, but not for polygon. So we have the shape modes, the flats, the smooths. So this gives us different effects and hopefully we have a monitor that can actually show the effect. Um, so the flat tells it to fill in the polygons with the solid colors. Current when the polygons last vertice was specified. The smooth tells it to uh, shade it with the triangle smoothing from the vertices, attempting to interpopulate the colors between the specified specified for each vertice, so it creates more of a smooth versus a flat um, effect. And sometimes you can't see the difference, uh, but it is in the way that it is painted and in the way that the color is applied to the polygons that are part of the substructure as to whether or not you're going to get a flat or whether or not you're going to get a smooth type of look. And actually, believe it or not, the level of detail that you're going to be obtaining is going to be increased with the number of polygons. So the lower number of polygons on a particular shape that you're drawing, less amount of detail that you're going to see. Higher number of polygons, more detail. And you learn that out through wireframing. I guess you remember the concept of wireframing? We saw wireframed images actually in that first Hello World diagram. Wireframing, for, and actually wireframing was popular for a very long time. It's gone way. In fact, you could have worked, could have gotten a job like maybe 10 years ago as a wireframer. What they used to do is they take uh, pictures, you know, like photographs, and you would wireframe it. Which means you'd scan it in the computer, take a computer graphic, like a BMP or whatever, or a JPEG version of that, outline it and using a graphic program such as OpenGL, and then fill it in with polygons. <laughs> with a ton of polygons, and the more polygons you put in there, actually, the more detail you could get, and then you color code the polygons to match the picture, and you're recreating the picture that had all these pixels, all this resolution that was kind of not too sharp when scanned in. You could create an animated version, or you can create a computer-generated graphic version of that photo that wasn't a picture, but it was actually in OpenGL, or it was in another graphic language that it was essentially a wireframe, and then you could either text, texture map the wireframe with the real picture. So you added the coloring of the real picture to the wireframe to create an animated picture, which was very lifelike. Or you turned that into a, you know, a fake you know, computer animated drawing or something. So you could take pictures of people, animals, dogs, cats, and stuff, turn them into, like, you know, make them part of a video game or something. And then they came out with better scanners. <laughs> scanners that could actually scan it into a wireframe. <laughs> and then it took away some of the jobs of the wireframers. The wireframer is actually kind of interesting. A lot of people like wireframing because you can quickly like take and create a right, nice little model of an image, a model of a, an object, and then you can play with the wireframe as a base and apply different things to it and transform it. It's hard to do that with like a, you know, like a paint
paint program. You can't do that in a paint program. So, to apply animation to it, to apply texturing, to use it outside of a you know flat image to turn it into a 3D model, 3D image, you have to wireframe it in order to do it. And that's still the case. I mean, the wireframing has not lost. It's lost its market in scanning technology, but it hasn't lost for game development. There's a lot of wireframing that still goes on. If you need to create a 3D model out of a 2D picture <laughs> if you're going to do that. So. Which is what wireframing was doing, was creating 3D models out of 2D pictures, 2D models, transforming it. So. Uh, and I think I have a wireframing example, and you can do that in OpenGL. Actually, you can take op you can create shapes that are wireframed. You can actually create a model. In fact, I have a humanoid. That you just apply skin to it, and it turns into a human. <laughs> Although it still looks like a humanoid, <laughs> um, you'd have to actually spend a little bit more time actually creating that into something that looked like a human. And then you can get yourself a job at Pixar <laughs> if you're that good. If you can create a humanoid looking object, then you can uh, work for the TV companies. <laughs> so, some of that stuff, you know, we've made some huge advancements. Some of that Pixar stuff. Yeah. Was it Roger Rabbit? I can't remember what the other ones were. Some pretty realistic stuff. Occasionally, in some of the scenes, you can kind of see where there's like a hole in the neck or something, or a polygon missing from the ear or something, or some really weird stuff. And then it tells you, reminds you, oh, this is done on a computer. This is computer animated graphics, so, which is using GLUT, OpenGL, and a bunch of other higher end libraries as well. Animation libraries, putting with that. Now here's a four sided polygon or quad, uh, revisiting the um, primitives, the general polygon. So, uh, let's see. Let's not get into lighting. Uh, Let's see, nah. All right, someone remind me. We stopped on slide 74. What I want to do next time, and we'll be meeting in this room again, and it'll be warmer. Next time, I want to bring in some more. I have to get organized, though, which is um, unfortunately I'm not this week. Uh, I need to bring in some more examples. So I want to do is show you some basic primitives and go through a couple of examples that show the basic structure that I went through because you can't learn it by uh, looking at PowerPoint slides you actually have to kind of play with it yourself and so I'd like to be able to adjust some images and show you some shapes that are being painted and apply some color to them and stuff like that and kind of see the primitives and just work with the primitives right now without, without any lighting next week I'll talk about lighting and uh, talk about color lighting continue on with more scene information. Shading, this, this gets into a bunch of other stuff. But you know the callback, you know the main, you know the loop, you know the basic foundation, which is what I wanted to show you today. Questions? No. And this is a good, if you wanted to get started, you know, if you want some homework, you want some stuff to do, install! <laughs> Install Dev C++. Go through that other video. It does work. Only problem is you got to reboot the computer. Install it. Get the example to work, and then come out here. And uh, actually, I'm gonna just try real quick. That's, I got a few minutes. So let's see. Simple. Watch it not work. It should do what, exactly what that uh, should give me the same. Oh, but let's see. Just want to make sure I get my includes correct. Sample is bigger than I expected. <laughs> Delete. See if I'm going to have to modify it. No, looks like it's going to work. There it is. Make sure you get that. <laughs> you don't, there's something wrong. And uh, if you notice what I just did, uh, each one of the examples is going to have a different variation of this include. And uh, I just left 
with the example. So what you can possibly do is just, you know, save a template, save this one. In fact, I'll save this one. I'll do a save as, and I'll stick it on the desktop. Save it so that, you know, what's going to end up happening eventually is you're going to put something in there, it's not going to compile for you. You're going to go, well, what's wrong? And most likely it's the include. I'm going to call this simple. C++, and I just saved it on the desktop, so in fact, I probably could get away without that. Yep, I can. So it should run. It should run without that, yeah. Okay, perfect. And it, I didn't set the orient. Actually, this is an interesting thing as well. If you notice the behavior, I didn't set the orientation. So it's actually running at the top left-hand zero, zero coordinate. I didn't set the window position. So what you might want to do as homework, actually, is... Uh, Go through that slide set, get the functions for the window position. You can see the titles up here. I set the title here, but down here you can add the stuff for the window position if you want. Change the colors of the screen, change the colors of that polygon, change the dimensions of the polygon. Uh, that's pretty much all you can pretty much do with this example, I think. Um, and then uh, it's a great way to kind of get your feet wet and, you know, get yourself, you know, in the Give yourself some confidence with it, because most students, especially ones who don't attend the class, will look at the assignments and go, what? What am I supposed to do? And uh, you'll see next week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw, I have, a, I have an ugly looking windmill with some ugly looking mountains that actually meets the assignment description that I'll show you. But it's kind of ugly looking, but it's just the concept. It's a windmill with some things. but. Uh, it's actually not, it's not as hard as it actually looks. It looks a lot harder to most people. So, all right, that's it. So if you can do that, that's probably a good way of getting up to speed so that you can at least follow along. Then we are done for today. Thank you. So this room next time, too. Oh, here it is. It's still running. <laughs>